everyone, and welcome to episode 25 of The Meeting Place, UTSC's Student Life Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Colleton, and on this podcast, I speak to one UTSC student each week about their experiences at UTSC. This week's guest is Shille, who talks about how she ended up picking UTSC for university, being awarded the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship, which allowed her to attend an internship in Malawi and her work with the African Impact Initiative. Shile, welcome to The Meeting Place. How are you doing today? Thank you, Jonathan. I'm doing very well. How are you? So good. And I'm so excited that you wanted to, to come on this podcast. So we talked about this like three, four months ago or something. Yeah. We, when we put out the word in the summer to try to get students on the podcast, you were like, I want to be on it, but I have so much schoolwork right now. And I'm like, no problem. We'll figure it out eventually. Um, and so here we are. It's finally happening a few months later. Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk about your time at UTSC and let's start with how you ended up at UTSC in the first place. So when you were applying to schools out of high school, how what was the thing about UTSC that uh, interested you? Okay, so actually I only applied to two schools and that's UTSC and University of Regina. Um, which is in Saskatchewan, for everyone who doesn't know. Um, but um, yeah, when, when I applied to UTSC, I think generally um, in, in the Nigerian community, you know, I'm Nigerian, in the Nigerian community, Nigerian parents always want their children to go to whatever they feel is the best school, right? And so there's always this, I guess, sense of competition where when it's close to that time, um, to apply to school, you know, all the like parents are meeting with each other and they're like, oh, where's your kid going? My kid got accepted here, blah, 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 et cetera. Right. And so I just thought, you know what, I'll apply to UTSC just so my mom might be happy, you know, never know. And then I applied to University of Regina because I was living in Regina at the time. And um, I actually didn't think I was go- going to get into UTSC because I've always heard that like they have such high standards and you need to have like such high grades, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I just thought mm, I pro- I'm probably not going to get in because I applied not because of my grades, but because I applied really, really late. And so I just assumed because they're probably offering admissions on a rolling basis. By the time they receive mine, there'll probably be no space. That was my assumption. Um, but I, I got in, they said yes. And then I was waiting on University of Regina for a really long time, but they, we're just kind of all over the place. I honestly think it was God's plan because it's 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 much easier to get into the U of R than to get into UTSC, right? Um, um, yeah, and so UTSC said yes, and then I just I, I looked up more information about Scarborough because I I used to live in Barrie, Ontario, so you know it was in Ontario still. So I thought, you know what, why not? Let's let's give it a shot. And I I liked that it wasn't you know because I I weighed the three campuses: Saint George, um, Mississauga's campus, and a friend of mine who was going to St. George at the time, told me how um, sometimes she'd have to take bus in between her classes, right? And I was like, I do not want to do that. No. <laughs> I don't I'm not do- about that life. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I'm not a fan of that at all. Um, and so I decided to just steer cl- clear of that. But I like Scarborough because I was like, you know, it's still in the city, but it's not in the middle of all the noise and everything, right? And when I do want the noise, when I want to explore, when I want to party, <laughs> I can, um, you know, Take take transit and and go out there, right? So I like that it was much quieter and things like that. So, all right. And so, program wise, what program had you got accepted for? Yeah, so I actually applied um, for a journalism and media studies major. Um, yeah, so that's what I got in for. Um, I think out of high school, I was really into like newscasting and reporting. And, you know, I'd always liked like public speaking and, and, you know, things in that fashion. So I thought, oh, I want to do journalism and media studies, learn a bit more. And I assumed that it was going to be very practical in terms of like them teaching me actual, um, well, well, practical journalistic skills, I guess, right? In my head, I thought of it more of a class where I'd be learning skills that I could even transfer if I were to ever have um, a live TV show or something like that, right? But that wasn't the case. Like actual like interview skills, like how to how to structure an interview, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. exactly. And like, is to- it more? Is it more like media theory? Exactly. It's more, it's very theoretical. It's more, it's more, of, I mean, it's, it's focused on important theories as well. For example, we learn how to gather news, how to look for credible sources, um, you know, staring clear of fake news and things like that. Right. So still important things to the field, obviously, but I think, you know, 
in my first year, as I took more courses, I realized I don't actually want to be a journalist. I'm just taking journalism because I'm hoping that it will give me skills for things like public speaking and having my own TV show and things like that, right? But I realized that I was learning um, media theory that journalists would need, right? So I, I, I decided to make a change a little bit. So I still stayed in media studies because you know, I still liked that aspect of it. And I switched my specialist instead to international development. International development. Okay. So yeah. how, like, what about that program interested you? To be honest, when I did at the time, I was just looking for something and I knew it couldn't be stats or econ or health. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> that is not my thing. Yeah. I'm not good at that. I'll do something else. Exactly. So I knew what it could not be. I knew it couldn't be anything health related because I knew like I was never going to go to med school or public health and things like that. And, you know, I remember how stats turned out in my first year. A friend of mine had told me of a statistics bird bird course, he called it. And uh, at the end- That doesn't exist. (laughs) I know. That's a lie. (laughs) At the end of the semester, I was like, I think I need a definition of what a bird course is because (laughs) this, because then I would attend, so there were two classes because the stats class was so huge. So I would attend my class. I think it was from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And then I would attend the second class from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., talk about motivated first year student. Um, So I would attend both classes and I would leave the classes still feeling very confused, right? And, you know, I remember when the final exam came, it was just, it was, it was not it. I didn't want to experience that again. (laughs) You know, I've talked to a lot of students in my time Mm -hmm. working at two different universities and I've never heard of a student going to both sections of a lecture to try and really understand the course. So one, good for you, (laughs) but two, good for you for recognizing after that, that like, yeah, I know this is is not it. Yeah. It was not it at all. I, I, I thought going to both would, you know, help me understand the concept better, but I think my brain is just not wired to stop. So I I knew it couldn't be that I knew it couldn't be econ. And I, I think then international development, I I don't know. I, I think at UTSC it's, it just started developing as a, as a field, right. They made the center for critical development studies. And so I read a little bit more about it and I thought, okay, you know what? Sure. Why not? Right. Um, And I was more interested because it had co-op, right? So there was a co-op term um, and I was like, well, this would be cool. I could gain work experience and things like that. So um, yeah, I decided to enroll into that and it's honestly been wonderful so far. It's been way more than I expected, you know, the, the benefits that I'm finding from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so you've been now in that program for what you switched after first year and now you've been in that all the way and you're in your last year. Yes, now? exactly. All right. So you've had three years of doing that basically. Right. And you realize like that's certainly something you're interested in. And are you still doing the media studies? Yes, I am. I am still doing a minor in media studies. And the minor is minor media studies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the, the program has honestly been very rewarding. I think um a lot of the because I a lot of people ask me when I say international development, they're like, oh, what's that? You know? Um Um, and it's, 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 it's really cool in the sense that you get to learn about the kind of work that goes on in, in community development and international development, right? When it comes to like, you know, aid and, um, and different countries working together to, I guess, improve their economies and things like that. And we just, we, we, I think we learn really fundamental concepts that even if you don't end up going into the development world and like maybe working in some African country or working for the government in the West to develop some countries, I think the concepts that, you know, we, I learned in that program will be very useful to me outside of the, the realms of development because we learn a lot to critically think, to critically analyze um, things a lot of the time. So I just, I am grateful and I'm happy that I stuck with that choice. Okay, perfect. And so because you mentioned co-op and um, you mentioned like development in the developing world. And I know you did an internship in Malawi. So is that connected? Is that because of the program you're in? Yeah, I I think so. Yeah. So uh, sometime in 2019, um, our, one of our supervisors in the center for critical development program, she emailed us about a Queen Elizabeth scholarship opportunity, um, which is basically an award that UTSC offers. I think they also offer it to non- international development students, but we always hear about it first um, because a lot of the people who go um, on that award and on that internship, they're usually students from international development. Yeah. So she had emailed us about it and um, essentially they're 
different positions in different countries like Malawi, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa. I had colleagues who went to different parts of the world and it was really cool. We were, we all, you know, went to the airport together and then we ended up going to like different places and things like that. But yeah, so um, I received the email about that and I read up on it and I was like, oh, this doesn't sound too bad. So usually I think it takes place in the summer. It's for two months, three months, sorry, from May um, till August. So end of May ish till August. Uh, so I decided I wanted to go to Malawi and I picked Malawi because I was like, Oh, you know, I'm probably going to go to Ghana sometime in my life because it's so close to Nigeria, but Malawi, that's so new. I I don't even know where Malawi is. So I definitely want to go there. I always try to, um, take advantage of opportunities that I think will be hard for me to, like realize on my own, right? So I feel that I won't necessarily pick up my bag and say, hey, I'm going to Malawi, right? So I was like, here's an opportunity. So let me let me do that. Um, and so I got to work with uh, this organization called World University Service of Canada. Um, they actually also have a head office in Ottawa, I believe. And so um, I, I, I got to go there and my role was to work as a communications officer. So I was in charge of helping um, the company with their newsletters and posting on social media, increasing awareness of, of the different events and um, activities that they do. They work a lot with women. Um, to build the capacity of women. So I was in charge of making sure that their programs are spreading far enough to women in the community. But while I was there, I was like, hmm, I don't want to post on social media for three months. <laughs> um, I want to do a little more, right? Um, and and I think the people I was working with really created the space for that, for more to happen. In fact, they had a certain budget for um volunteer programs, right? So if you're a volunteer and you, you know, came up with a certain project or initiative, there's some money set aside for you to fund that program, right? Or whatever it is that you decided to do. Um, and so, you know, while I was just thinking around that, I, I ended up talking to a lot of the youth there and a lot of them are just so filled with passion and and they're so determined and you know it's they're the kind of people that you ask like what it is that you want to do in the future and they give you the answer right away right um because the environment there is just a little bit different right and so people i find that people you know knew right away what it is that they wanted to do or they knew right away how it is that they wanted to achieve it but the problem was that they didn't know like who would support them into making that dream a realization or what organizations could help them, right? Um, For example, if I want to act, for example, in Malawi, it's probably not conducive for me to just start recording and post it on YouTube, right? It would be necessary for me to work with maybe a media organization or a film production organization and then get my foot in the door that way. So the problem was bridging the gap between the youth's desire and like who would help them sort of get their foot in the door and get that started, right? So there was a lot of problems in that area to the point that a lot of people felt that, you know, a lot of people I talked to felt that, yeah, I know what I'm going to, what I want to do, but there's no one to help me with it. So I might as well, you know, just not pursue it or just, just give up. Right. And I, I didn't like hearing, hearing those stories and I didn't like hearing them feel like, you know, they had no hope and, and that no one was able to help them. And of course there wasn't much I could do, right. I couldn't fund, you know, people to act in school or to fashion school and things like that. Right. And even my organization couldn't necessarily do that, but because WISC, which is the organization I worked with, they had a lot of partner organizations. For example, they worked with MHub, which is a um, technology innovation hub, right? They worked with uh, Arise, which which is an organization that helps young girls um, to school and to increase their literacy and things like that, right? So I thought, why don't we create something where we can bring all these organizations together and bring the youth together and, you know, let's see how everyone can collaborate with one another, right? And so since, sorry, I hope I'm not, am I, am I talking a lot? <laughs> Let me know no, if this is what the, no, this is what the interviews are all about. And I'm, the reason I'm not, I'm not stopping you. Cause I'm like, I want to hear where this is going. Yeah. Like, this is super interesting. Okay. So keep going. Perfect. Yeah. So, and you know, since I, I love talking, I love any opportunity for public speaking. I just, I love putting my, I, I love being on a stage, right? I just feel like that's where I feel fulfilled and that's where things feel and, and look magical to me. So I thought, you know what, instead of these, you know, 
young people just sharing their dreams and their talents to me, why don't I give them the opportunity to share it to a wider audience, right? Why don't I give them the opportunity to share with more people or to share it with people who possibly can help them in ways that I cannot, right? And so I thought I would start a speech competition platform because I, you know, genuinely love to talk. I love being on a stage. I love, you know, sharing and 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 just being in front of a large audience, right? And so I thought that I could give the youth an opportunity to share their, their dreams their hopes and passions in a space that's beyond just me, right? To an audience that's actually capable of supporting them and and, and taking that um, dreams and passions that they have, taking it somewhere. And so I started a speech competition platform and I called it Malawi Talks. So I wrote the proposal to my boss. I submitted it. He thought it was a great idea. And you know, the way that you know that people there are so hungry to do something for themselves and they're so um, fearless about their passion is that all I had to do was post about the opportunity on Facebook. And I got over 30 response in, I think, four hours, right, of people wanting to um, submit what they wanted to talk about or submit um, or just express their interest in being a part of the contest, right? Um and so I, um, I had to ensure because, you know, I guess coming from Canada, I, 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 I think of things, you know, I think of executing things in ways that are different. And so I had to adjust that a little bit. For example, I couldn't make the um, entry into the contest only online because a lot of people didn't have access to computers and things like that, right? So I had to set it up in a way where they could drop it at the office and just bring a written copy to the office or something like that. Yeah, so essentially they the, the youth had to submit an entry of, you know, just just talking about their passions or their hopes and expectations for the future. And that was, that was the prompt. Right. Um, and so a lot of them ended up submitting that. And what I did was I reached out to all the organizations that the organization I worked with were partners with, and I asked them to reach out to their partner organizations and sort of get everyone involved. Right. So I'd say, Hey, um, I'll be hosting a speech competition platform and this day and some youth are going to be presenting you know, things that they're passionate about and the changes that they want to see in, in their world or in their society. And they were expected to come with the hopes of taking on some of these people, right? Rather, either as interns in the organization or volunteers or as part-time workers, whatever it was. So um, on the day of, um, you know, we, before then, actually, I also reached out to um professionals in in the community to mentor these youth right so once they wrote their entry they got that mentorship in terms of presentation and writing and speaking right um because obviously not everyone was well versed in all the areas for example someone could write a really good speech but they needed a little bit more help with presenting themselves right um so they, they got mentorship on that end with the professionals on their speech and they we worked it we had a couple of workshops for that um, and so, you know, the winners, there were, there were going to be three winners who would be rewarded with monetary prizes, but then everyone else, just by virtue of being a participant of the competition would have an opportunity to partner or work with an organization that perhaps fit was in line with what they were hoping to do. Um, and so on the day of everyone came, I think we had more people than expected. So on the day of, we had to order more food and things like that because the community was really interested in just seeing their young people um, take the mantle and take the front for that event. So everyone showed up and it was such a lovely occasion. And it was just, it was, it was so beautiful to see the youth come together and, 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 and just, you know, present themselves to the community and present themselves to the organizations and showcase their talents and just be fearless in the pursuit of everything that sets their soul on fire, right? It was just so beautiful to see. And um, at the end of the day, the winners got their monetary prizes. Um, the other participants got organizations who was like, hey, I really liked what you were talking about there. Would you like to, would you perhaps be interested in this opportunity and things like that, right? And the mentorship from the um, speech training actually carried carried on even after the competition. So yeah, it was just, it was really wonderful and, and rewarding to do something like that. So I, you know, it's funny when you said you like to talk and I'm like, I like to talk too, <laughs> which is why I actually, it's a great for me to have started a podcast where I'm forced to just shut up and listen to people because then I get to hear amazing stories like that. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's a great Thank story. You. It sounds like you had a really, a really positive experience and 
like it, it helped you, I'm sure, in terms of putting into practice some of what you were actually studying yeah. at UTSC. Uh, and, and at the same time, like you get to really benefit people who wouldn't have had the opportunity to do this unless you help set it up for mm -hmm. them. So that's fantastic to hear. And I'm really seeing a connection. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let you tell me, but I see much of a connection here between what you were doing over there and the fact that you're involved in TEDx at UTSC. I see quite a connection there. It sounds like uh, you have very similar interests for similar reasons. Yeah. So would that be accurate? Yeah, actually, it's, it's so funny that you mentioned that because before I went to Malawi, I had, I had applied for something called OpenX, right? So OpenX is a branch of TEDx that's just dedicated to um, people under a certain age group, just to 30 years old. Um, sorry, people under a certain age group up until 30 years old. So whereas TEDx is for everyone, right? Um, so, you know, I had applied to that opportunity for open X and it was happening in London. They were um, recruiting some people to come speak and things like that. And um, I applied, but unfortunately I didn't get in. So I think it was that, you know, drive of like wanting a, a platform to speak on that I that I took with me when I went to Malawi and thought, oh, you know what? I wanted to speak at something similar, but I didn't get the opportunity to. So maybe I can create the same type of opportunity for people here in Malawi. And of course, um, you know, with being a part of TEDS UTSC really helped as well because I um in my role as the lead of program development, I actually recruited the speakers that we had. And so I went through a similar process of, um, you know, looking at the ideas that the speakers had and what they wanted to talk about and helping them fine tune it and helping them with like, you know, the presentation and the delivery on the day of and meeting with them, keeping up with them to see, um, seeing how their ideas and how they're fleshing everything out. Right. So I think it was that similar mindset that I carried on with me, in Malawi. And it was so funny because when I was doing Malawi talks, that's when I interviewed to be a part of TEDx UTSC, right? So everything was just sort of working hand in hand together, but I didn't even see it as so then. It's now that, I, that I'm now seeing everything as like a, you know, a big picture, like the different pieces of the puzzles are coming together, right? Um, but yeah, that was when I interned to be a part of TEDx UTSC because I had attended the conference the year before and I was just like, wow, who put together this amazing event like from the from the, um, the 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 decoration, like how the room looked on the day to the speakers, to the sound, to, you know, the audience. I was just so amazed by how put together everything was at that conference that I was like, I want to be a part of this <laughs> next time. So I decided to apply and yeah. What's great to hear from that is that you can be a student at UTSC and see something and say like, I want to, I want to be involved in this. I want to help support yeah. this. And in a lot of cases, you're going to get the opportunity to do it because these are all student led initiatives. And so they need students like you to help drive these things forward and make them yeah. happen. And so it's great to see that. I also have to imagine, were you doing the interview for TEDx from Malawi, yes. you had to do this online. Yeah, interview, so which and at the time that would seem like such a foreign concept almost, and that's how we live our lives. Yeah, these days. that's so true. I definitely agree. Um, when I had to interview, so you, everyone who interviewed for TEDx, I think who wasn't. Um, at UTSC at the time, because this was in the summer, everyone who had traveled, they did like a Skype or something like that. But I couldn't do that because the internet connection just wasn't allowing it, right? And so I had to record the answers to my questions on my phone. And I still remember sitting then there at my office and like recording the answers to the questions a couple of times and trying to pick the best one and like tweaking it a little bit, even though I wasn't supposed to edit it. <laughs> I would go on iMovie and just, you know, cut out parts where I was making mistakes and I was trying to make it so perfect because, you know, TEDx, TEDx UTSC, it's very, I think it's one of those clubs that's very high up there, right? Because the work that the students do there, it, it takes a lot to, to put the conference together, right? I mean, like you said, it's a student, student led group putting together a full blown conference with um, speakers from all different backgrounds and all different types of professions. And not only that, but even getting students interested enough to want to attend the event, right? Doing the ticket sales and everything. So I was like, no, this is such an important club and I have to say all the right things to make sure that I get in. And I think that's 
like you mentioned, that's what I love about UTSC, that a lot of things are very focused on students, right? Um, when I was working at the Department of Student Life, I was actually telling, I think, a first year that, you know, here at UTSC, anyone can start anything, right? Like you have any idea, you want to start any club. Is it the food club, gaming club, whatever it is, right? Just as long as you can get a, a couple of people together and you guys can put your ideas together, then there's no one stopping you, right? And I, I love that so much about the school because, you know, it's four years of your life. Life, right and or five or six for some people and one thing I always say is that you know the I mean maybe not the worst thing but I think the the least beneficial thing you can do for yourself is to make that four years only about getting good grades and attending classes right it's a long four years five years six years is a long time right and so you have to be developing other skills in in, in those four years whether you're going to start a, a company a club or business with other colleagues or you're going to realize new passions and potentials of talent or you're going to network with other kind of people whatever it is that you know works for you that's outside of the realms of just attending classes and doing your exams I think that has to happen right and I I think UTSC gives the opportunity well enough for that to happen. So that's that's what I really love about the school, actually. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, clearly my whole job is to support students in those endeavors. Mm-hmm. And so I'm a big supporter of it. And I believe it because that was my experience at university where I realized much like you in my first year, I was like, I'm not going to do this like as a career. I, this isn't what I'm interested in anymore. So I had to find other skill sets that were going to make me employable in the future. And basically I, I looked at all these people running all these fun initiatives on campus and I was like, they get paid to do this. Like I should do that. And so I volunteered and I did all these things. And now I have a job where I support students getting those same skills. So a hundred percent, I agree that it's, it's also kind of the last place where everyone around you is trying to learn all the mm. time. And it's 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 not high school. It's In high school, everyone has to be there. So some people aren't having a great yeah. time. But a university, that's a choice. You've chosen exactly. to come here. So you might as well take advantage of all the opportunities that exist while you are there. And in a lot of cases, you're going to find out about something that you didn't know you were as interested so in because you kind of took a chance to get involved in something. Yeah, that's so true. Definitely agree with that. Mm-hmm. So the other organization that you're involved with that I want to talk about, the African Impact Initiative. Were you one of the original founding members of that club? Did you join it partway through? How did that all start? Yeah, so um, I was not. I was not the um, one of the original founding members. Um, I think in the summer of 2018, I believe, um, the founder who is a Fosa Obana had reached out to me because, you know, his brother is Osas and I'm really, Osas and I are really good friends. So you know what's funny? I only figured that out when, so if Asa added me on LinkedIn or I added him or something, and then I saw his last <laughs> name and I was like, oh, wait a minute, they might be brothers. I didn't know that. Um, I figured it out like in the last few oh, months. Oh yeah, so, that's anyway. crazy. <laughs> that's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, so um, Asas and I are really good friends and he was like, oh, my brother would love to talk to you about um, his organization, um, and which is which also is a club at UTSA. So I thought, I was like, oh, sure, why not? Um. And then I didn't really know much about the organization, but I had attended a conference that they hosted um, in that school year. And it was a really great conference. I think um, they they talked about, um, I think the, the, the theme was surrounding brain drain or something like that, right? Um, so they they had invited a bunch of speakers and, and I attended the conference and it was really great. So I was like, oh, okay, sure. So I talked to his brother and he just gave me more um, information about the organization and what their goals are and what they're about and what they currently do. And uh, I thought it was a, a great opportunity. So I joined the um, team as their social media and marketing executive. Um, but then last year, um, I was promoted to uh, co-president. So Sasa and I actually co-president the club. And it's been such a reward, rewarding experience so far because I think, it, again, it goes. And it's so funny how, you know, like I said, when I started taking international development, I was just like, well, I know I can't take these other things, so I'll just go for this, right? But everything that I've um, had the opportunity to do after that, it's just sort of like, everything has, I don't know, just merged together in a way that it's all come together. Like it seemed, it seems as though I planned it all out, right? When I really did it. 
yeah, so with African Impact, there is there is a um, team at UTSC that runs student led events, and basically we try to cater to the need of needs of African students at UTSC. Right, um, oftentimes people always ask us, you know, I'm here in Canada, but I still want to stay connected to my roots in Africa. I still want to stay connected back home and things like that. Right, and we're just there to just sort of bring that converse, bring conversations that are important to have for Africans that are in the diaspora and that are important for everyone to have as well. Right. I think oftentimes when people hear African Impact Initiative, they're like, oh, no, that's just for Africans. I shouldn't be here. But that's not the case, right? Because if we're going to talk about the development of Africa or if we're going to talk about, you know, anything that's related to Africa, it's important that, you know, there's a diverse group of people in that conversation, right? Because it's not only Africans affecting Africa, right? Um, people in the West, people in other parts of the world also affect Africa. And it's important for all of us to come together when we're having those important conversations, right? Yeah, so throughout the year, um, we actually host a few events at UTSC. So um, sometimes we do like career development events where we would invite professionals um, in the finance organizations to maybe teach us about how to save more or invest our money and things like that. We've done... Um, uh, career events where, you know, we had professionals come talk to us about interviews and building our resumes and cover letters and things like that. But our biggest event that we do at the school is our annual conference. And with this conference, we always, you know, pick a theme that we think is important to discuss in, in that season. For example, our next conference is going to be on changing the African narrative, right? Um, and so we're going to be inviting people from different backgrounds and different fields to help us see better into that theme, right? What are some of the things that we can do to help change the African narrative, even if we're not there, even if we're in the diaspora, even if we're not Africans, right? Um, how can we contribute to changing that narrative? So that's what we're going to be talking about this year. And I just enjoy seeing students come together and express, you know, uttermost concerns, right? Because actually there are people who are really concerned and, and who, who really, I, I don't know, have worries about how they can impact where they're from, despite the fact that they're here, right? Um, and I think for a lot of people who are international students, that's often a concern, right? Because you're in this place, you're in this land that flows with milk and honey, and you definitely want to still connect to your roots. You definitely want to still give back, but sometimes there's struggles with how to do that, right? So during during our conference, you know, people, who, the people we invite to speak actually help us to bridge that gap and give us advice on how we can do that. So it's been really great. And then our external team actually goes to different African countries and they, um, you know, develop initiatives there. For example, last year, we worked with some hospitals in Nigeria um, to give them supplies that they can use to improve uh, the effectiveness of, of care and the quality of care at the hospital. So, yeah. And then in this year, we started the African Impact Challenge. Um, which is centered towards youth. Different youths from all over the world are called upon to um, think about community sustainable solutions, right? Like what's the problem in your community and what can you do to fix it? And we want it to just be centered around the youth, the projects and the initiatives that they can come up with. So that's pretty much what African Impact Initiative is about. And yeah. Well, it's a great organization. I know your conferences every year have been super successful and uh, and I hope to see that group continue to be super successful over Thank the years. You. And and also now that I have Ifosa on LinkedIn, I get to see all the work that's going on with the like external yeah. group and there's like tons of stuff going on. So it's really cool to see how students on a campus at UTSC can be affecting change um, like on our campus, but then working with an organization that's affecting it on a very global international that's level. Right. So that's fantastic. That's so, so I have to imagine now with all of these things that you've been doing over your time at university and, and all of these things that like are helping you kind of build up the skills that you're interested in and, and building up kind of adding on to the education you're getting. I have to imagine you've got some big plans for once you do graduate. So what is the plan for you when you are done school at UTSC? All right. I hope I don't disappoint you because it's not very development related. But um, so I am planning to go to law school. I'm actually currently studying for my law school admission test, which is in a week from today. Oh, my goodness. I cannot. 
Exactly. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, 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 I freak out every day. Every time I'm studying, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't think I'm studying enough. It's so close. And, you know, it's it's not a super hard test. It's something that can be learned, but it's just, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know this about the LSAT, but like the time factor, right? Where you have 35 minutes to complete a set of 25 questions, right? Which means you have like one minute per question. I mean, who, who set that up? Who put that in place? <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's that's what I'm currently doing. I'm studying for the law school admission test. And um, I was actually just talking to someone about this last week that even though, you know, I'm not pursuing something that's very development focused right after school, I'm still so glad that I chose international development because, you know, many people usually choose the realms of poli sci and, and you know, poli, poli sci when they're going into law school. But I have honestly learned some foundational and fundamental concepts in international development that I think will come in very handy in law school. And even just the ability to critically think and critically analyze situations, right? Because when it comes to development, you things are not never black and white, right? So you'd see like a scenario where maybe, okay, this country gave aid to this country to help them improve their agriculture, I don't know, sector or something like that, right? But you have to critically analyze that situation because that's not, it's not, it's not just, you know, point blank period, right? There are usually some, I don't know, like levels of contestation or some things that happen in that process or some issues of power or structural inequality and things like that, right? So, you know, that, that lens that, that we've been trained to, to always critically analyze situations, I think it's very important, you know, in, in, in the field of law, right? So um, definitely still glad that I chose international development and hopefully I do well on my law school admission test and get into a good law school. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the plan currently. Fantastic. Are you applying to U of T law school? Well, <laughs> I want to, but, but okay. So the deadline for UTSC was way back in September. And by then I was not even, you know, you because of all the things that you need to have with the application, like the recommendation letters, your personal statement of interest, you know, your resumes and everything. So I was not even on top of any of that. So I felt that I couldn't, you know, meet the, the, that the application requirements at the time. But once I'm done my test, I can see, you know, what the openings are for other terms of the year, because my plan is to go into school right away. But I can see like, you know, what other openings they have and, and see, because I I'd definitely love to apply to UTSC, but the deadline was just super soon. Whereas other schools like in the US, their deadline is still like January next year, right? So oh, yeah, okay. it's a yeah, big yeah. So yeah, and there's a lot of different options then if you're considering like the US as well, there's a way more law schools. There yeah. Too, right? So you got a lot of different options to consider. Right. Yeah. But then I, I think schooling in Canada is, um, has proven to be more beneficial for me. Every time I mentioned the US, people are like, you want to go to the US at this time? <laughs> Yeah, we should point out that I know this episode won't go out for a bit, but we're recording this like they still haven't announced who the president is. I think we all know who it's going to be at this yeah. point. And I'm not going to I'm not going to try and this is not a political yeah, podcast. So we're not going to get into exactly. it. But I'm sure a lot of people are much happier today than they were a week mm. ago. So, um but yeah. anyway, moving on yeah. from that. So, it sounds like you've you know, you know what you're doing now and it's some of those, I'm sure, being a, a lawyer, some of those public speaking skills you've practiced are going to come in handy. Cool. Some of the stuff you, all these different organizations you've been involved with, it sounds like those are really going to benefit you in a future career. So it seems like you've really figured out a good path for Thank yourself. Thank you. I hope so. I hope uh, it turns out to, to look like that all in the end. <laughs> well, yeah. And hopefully some other students will hear this and realize that you can figure out in first year that that's not what you want to do anymore and still find a good path by just switching up programs, getting involved in some things, and it'll bring you where you Most want to be. Most definitely. I think the biggest misconception about university is that you need to know what you're going in for right away, right? Um, people spread that narrative a lot because this is university. This is not high school. So you need to know what you need to do. You need to be on top of your game. I think that's absolutely not true. I think it's fine to actually not know because then, because you're in a place where there is... Um, there's opportunity to explore, right? But when you zero your mind and say, I just want to do this and only this, then you kind of rob yourself of that opportunity to explore different areas. Of course, I'm not saying that, you know, it's more disadvantageous to know what you want to do, but I'm just saying that when you don't, that's in fact okay. And honestly, it can, it can be a blessing because you get to explore different areas that you, you know, didn't even think could be 
possible areas of interest, right? And when you talk to UTSC students, you can see that a lot because you hear, I'm doing a minor in psychology and a major in neuroscience, right? Or like I'm doing a, a minor in health studies and a major in computer science, right? So it's you, you can you can see like like that people are really exploring different areas and different fields and and different passions. And I think that's absolutely what you should do in university. So definitely, you know, if someone's listening to this and they're on shore and they're in their second year, I don't think you know it's something to count as a loss of course there has to be like some form of planning and some sort of like self-reflection where you sort of think like okay at least I know I hate this and don't want to do this so these are my other options like I did um but that's that just goes to say that not knowing what to do is is okay that's absolutely fine those are fantastic words of wisdom so we're we're gonna end it there thank you so much for sharing your experience today Thank you so much, Jonathan, for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.